Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first panel, which is called Information Policy, what it is and why we need it. Uh, we have three guest speakers here today, panelists today, and they each have their own perspective and specialization in the area of information policy. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak, and then we will have time for questions. Um, our first speaker is Craig Cram. He's Associate Director of, information po of Copyright and Information Policy at New York Public Library. Our second speaker is Heather Joseph. She is executive director at SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resource Coalition. Um, our third speaker was scheduled to be Barbara Jones from the Office of, of Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association. Um, she unfortunately had a last minute cancellation and could not make it today. Um, Jim Neal will be here embodying her in person and delivering remarks on her behalf. Um, with, I should say, probably less than 12 hours notice, so thank you for doing that. I'm Barbara Jones and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Craig. Hi, good morning everyone. So uh, forgive me for the little, I've got a little bit of a cold and can't hear out of one ear, so it's gonna be a little bit of an interesting panel, but we'll see how this goes. Uh, so first, thanks to Columbia for having me. Uh, this, Jim's talk and Carol's talk were certainly inspiring and um, I certainly have uh, some threads to pull on it. Um, so first I'm going to start off about me and what I do. So I work at this place, this beautiful marble palace down the road a bit, um, and I love working there. I'm the Associate Director of Copyright and Information Policy at NYPL. Um, what does that mean? No one knows what my job title means, that's so why we try to fix it and say copyright, but still I get questions, what does that mean? Well, there's 45 of us, uh, roughly, who do what I do at libraries. Uh, and that's a number that's doubled in the last three years. Um, but of those 45, there's only one of us who works at a public library, and that's me. Uh, I'm the copyright person at NYPL, and I am a copyright nerd. Uh, my job at NYPL is first to expand access as broadly as possible, both here in the physical space, but also in the digital space. My job is to work with curators to increase access to our collections as broadly as possible. And my second job is don't get sued. <laughs> don't get sued and lose. Very important part of that. Um, my third job, uh, more recently, has been to engage in copyright policy conversations, both in DC and in New York, um, especially now that Congress has started a review of copyright law. My role is to advocate on behalf of NYPL and its users for better and more rational copyright policy. Uh, in fact, last year we testified before Congress uh, on behalf of NYPL about the first sale doctrine. Jim actually testified uh, last year too on preservation issues at, in libraries. So why are libraries creating these kinds of positions? Why have our ranks doubled in the last three years? Well, it kind of goes back to our usage. So uh, a couple of years ago, we had 1.6 million research materials used at NYPL. 1.6 million. That's a good number. It's, it's actually been going up a little bit. Um, but at the same time, we had 127 million digital images viewed on our website. That's an 80 times difference between the two. For 100 years, we focused our energy on physical objects, but now we're increasingly focused on digital access. This shift, this change, as Jim discussed in his presentation, from users coming to libraries to libraries meeting users in their space has some important implications. The first implication is that libraries are digitizing their collections, whether in-house or using partners. This small little partner uh, entered this space in 2004 um, and now has over 25 million volumes in its corpus. Libraries are starting to push that digitized content beyond the four corners of their websites. They're sharing that digital content with third parties to enhance access and reach users. And using entities like DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America, and Hadi Trust, uh, an important preservation partner that you've already heard about a little bit this morning. But this digitization and sharing has its own implications. And first, uh, that's copyright liability. Right, so uh, statutory damages are up to $150,000 per infringement. If we digitize 10 items and hit the maximum statutory damages, that's 1.5 million. If we digitize 1,000 items and hit the maximum statutory damages, that's $150 million. Those numbers get really big and really scary really quickly. 
But because the stakes are so high, libraries need to do the research necessary to understand and accept the risk of digitizing their collections and making them more broadly available. Unfortunately, we've, we've had a few copyright lawsuits against libraries in recent years. But the good news is that libraries have been mostly successful at defending their activities. Last June, an appeals court confirmed that Hadi Trust's uses of its scans of digital books were lawful. That's good news. And that's because of a doctrine called fair use. The doctrine of fair use can play an important role in achieving the goals of libraries. And I think that's the most important issue facing libraries in the copyright sphere today. Although the rights holder has certain rights to exploit their works, those rights are balanced with the exceptions and limitations that allow users to use works in certain ways without the permission of the rights holder. This balance is based in the constitutional clause establishing copyright law. It says, the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their, their uh, respective writings and drawings. Of all of the exceptions and limitations found in copyright law today, fair use is by far the broadest and does the most work. It serves to promote the progress of knowledge by allowing courts to evaluate whether new uses should be permitted without the permission of the rights holder. It's the most frequently and cited uh, exception in the copyright law, and billions of dollars of, businesses, of business are based on, the fair use, on fair use. For a little review, there are four factors in fair use. The first is uh, asking what the purpose and character of the use is. How are you using that work? Are you using it for commercial purposes? And in fact, over the last 20 years or so, this factor has shifted a little bit to include the question of whether your work is, or whether your use is transformative. Did you add value to the original? Did you create new information, aesthetics, insights, insights or understandings to the original work? If you did, that may tend toward fair use. Second factor is the nature of the work. Was it highly creative, the work that you want to use? Was it highly creative? Was it unpublished? If it's highly factual, then there's more latitude to reuse that item. I mean, this is kind of a less of an important factor today. It really, it's back to the first factor is more important than, than this factor, but it's, it's, in the fa it's in the list. The third factor is how much did you use? Was it the appropriate amount for the purpose that you were trying to make of the, of the item? Did you take the most important bits? If you did, that's going to tend against fair use. But if you only used a small portion of it, that may tend toward fair use. And finally, the fourth factor is the market impact. How did you impact the market for the original work in your uses? And if your, work, if your use is transformative, then there's likely no market for that transformative use, and, and therefore you may not be impacting the market at all. So those are the four factors in fair use. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit of story, a story about a collection that we looked at uh, and used fair use to make available today. So in, 19 and 19, in 1939 and 1940, 60 nations, 33 states and U.S. territories, and over 1,000 exhibitors gathered in Queens, New York for the World's Fair. Over 45 million people visited the fair over the two seasons. At the conclusion of the fair, the, corporate, the corporation responsible for the fair donated their records to NYPL. The donation included more than 2,500 boxes of records and documents, as well as 12,000 promotional photographs. This collection is heavily, heavily used by researchers, so we wanted to digitize the 12,000 photos to make them available online. So we researched the collection to understand the copyright issues and attempted to locate a rights holder. We spent many days searching the corporate records since we had them all, and we were unable to find who currently owns the rights in the collection. In fact, we couldn't figure out how the rights were transferred at the end of the corporation's dissolution. If we wanted it to move forward with this collection without a seeking a license, we would have to understand the risk of digitizing this collection and making it available online. And the risk wasn't something easily uh, dismissed. In the worst case scenario, digitizing all of these photos, uh, we would have been on the hook for $1.8 billion in potential liability, roughly seven times NYPL's annual budget <laughs> for 1,200 photos, 12,000 photos. So knowing this risk, uh, and despite that huge and scary number, we conducted a fair use analysis of our uses, of the uses we wanted to make. And we determined that despite this huge number, 
the risk was small that someone would actually object and let alone someone bring a lawsuit against us. So we accepted that risk in light of our mission to expand access to our material and decided to digitize the collection of photos. And here are the results. So we made an interesting, a number of interesting and productive uses of it. The first use was digitizing it and making it available online in our digital collections platform. We also created a website that added context to the collection, including, memo, or including notes from curators and, and interesting uh, new content that was added next to the World's Fair content. Finally, we even created an iPad application that was named one of the top educational apps for that year. And it was all without any takedowns. We haven't received a takedown request since these things have been up, and we don't expect to get one anytime soon. Fair use played a significant role in our decision to do these things. We felt comfortable that as orphaned works, there was likely no market harm to these photos for our uses, and we felt that our uses were transformative. Therefore, we did the project. I have some more good news. Um, not every institution has a me. There's only 45 of us uh, in the country. But, but because fair use has become such a critical tool for libraries to achieve their missions, there are more and more resources available to help libraries make decisions. And although fair use determinations are made on a case-by-case -case analysis, there are some general principles that tend to favor fair use. There have been a number of codes of best practices in recent years that have come out talking about how fair use can work and the, some, of the, some of the factors that go towards a finding of fair use. These best practices are put out by the organizations most dealing with these complicated issues, including the one in the middle by ARL. There's even an entire week dedicated to fair use in February. If you missed it, uh, it'll be again next year. It's the end of February. Um, there's plenty of opportunities to learn more about fair use. With a growing desire and capability to digitize our collections and make them more broadly available, fair use is the most critical copyright issue for research libraries today. As Jim said, we're changing from being risk adverse to understanding that risk is necessary to achieve our missions. But I'm not saying that we should put everything we have online in full text right now. Libraries are not pirates. But it is not civil disobedience to assert that ex the exceptions and limitations granted to us by Congress are to assert and use those exceptions and limitations. We should not be in constant fear of being sued. Instead, we should be constantly afraid that not asserting limitations and exceptions is hurting our mission. Just as we keep our doors open despite the risk that we'll get sued for a slip and fall, we should similarly be willing to take reasonable informed risks when we believe our uses are likely to be fair uses. Carol quoted President Roosevelt, and I'll add one more. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those timid spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory or defeat. Dare mighty things. Use your fair use, and we can do it. <laughs> Thank you. So that was the most masterful use of PowerPoint since Larry Lessig. Um, I think you're like now a legend in this community and have set the bar. You'll notice that I don't have any PowerPoints. And this is because the symposium is in Jim Neal's honor. And the first presentation I ever did in front of Jim 15 years ago, he came up to me and he said, great message, but you wrote your speech on your PowerPoints. Um, and it was true. I think when I first started, I, I, I used my PowerPoints as, as my script. So today, in honor of you, I have a script, but it's not on PowerPoint. <laughs> And it's not a strict script, actually. It is more of um, uh, trying to use this opportunity to express a little bit about what Jim has enabled in the information policy environment for those of us who work in and for the library community. Um, Jim was the chair of the board of SPARC, um, which is the organization uh, that he, along with many other esteemed colleagues, uh, and Carol Mandel and Kenny in the room today, helped to found about uh, 13 or 14 years ago. And he chaired that, that organization when I came aboard as director nine years ago. And it's no um, uh, accident that Spark's, uh, Spark was created with a specific mission. And that mission is specifically to be a catalyst for action. It's the first line of our mission statement. It's how we describe ourselves. It's what we live to try to um, achieve every day. And Spark's mission of taking action is in a very specific layer of uh, the world we inhabit in the library community. And that's the layer of providing um, equitable access and ensuring productive use of materials in the digital environment. 
And so Spark's mission really is to look for ways to affect positive change to a $10 billion a year industry uh, that basically has had a lock on distributing um, in specific one layer of information, and that's journal articles, um, as well as controlling the rules of the game um, in terms of how those articles can not only be accessed and shared, but also used and reused in the digital environment. So Spark's way of operating, uh, thanks to our founders, has always been to try to um, sift through options, to try to find pressure points in this very, very large, very, very global and complex system, to look for those pressure points that if we push on, uh, might just give a little, or if we're successful, give a lot, uh, in terms of, of moving uh, the market and the system in, in a positive direction. And we had lots of possible PowerPoints, uh, pressure points, PowerPoints. <laughs> Not so Freudian slip there. <laughs> Lots of possible pressure points that we could think about um, poking at or, or working on in, in the environment. Business models, technologies, organizational structures, all very worthy pressure points uh, uh, to explore. But the pressure point that we have settled on uh, and really worked on for the last 10 years is the, the pressure point of policy. And that's because it really presents a unique opportunity to to do something very large, and that's change the underlying rules of the playing field or game board uh, that, the system is, that the system is operating on. And that, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a big opportunity. And it, it's interesting because the, the particular pressure point that we focused on, taking down barriers to access and the productive reuse of, of um, uh, information and creating a new, a level, and an open playing field is not an area which was particularly active in, in terms of uh, specific policies designed to address this space. Um, and increasing access to research results, frankly, uh, was not in the interest of the industry who, who, um, whose interests were being served over the last several decades, uh, the closest, the best, um, by the, 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 the rules that existed. They had no interest in changing the, 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 the playing field. Yet, we in the library community really and truly did. This is an existential area for us to get right. Um, so one key thing that Jim has taught me uh, is that we always have choices. Um, we have choices in any given situation on how we choose to, to act or react. And I think that that's so important. We can be reactive or proactive. We can choose to play defense or we can choose to play offense. And we chose to play offense in the policy arena in a new way. We really chose to go all in and be part of uh, uh, the process of actively creating and shaping new policies that would reset the rules and set new operating terms in this particular space that would better serve our community's need. Um, and that meant a willingness to be bold, to knock on doors and to ask for a seat at any table where decisions were being made that would affect the policies in this specific arena. Um, we are the library community. We de generally tend to ask and knock politely, and we should do that. We need to do that. That's the starting point. But what we've also learned is that we need to knock politely, firmly, insistently, repeatedly, however long we need to do it until the door opens. The role of activist, as Jim pointed out in his open opening remarks, is thankfully completely consistent with the role of librarian and library professional. As long as what we're advocating for, once the door is open and we get the seat at the table, is, uh, in, advances the mission of our institutions and professions, and it is really in harmony with the values that sustain our community as the library community, as the academy, as well as serve the public and the public's interest. It's that connection that makes it so important for us to play uh, the role of advocate in this arena. And I, I was kind of grateful, kind of coming into this new way of thinking and operating uh, to, to look around the policy environment to see how our community was acting in other areas. And in particular, in the, the area of privacy and protecting uh, our, our patrons' um, pr uh, privacy rights, uh, I was really pleased to see that that was an area where this community has been um, really 
uh, singularly unafraid. And one day I was doing a Google search for an image to try to find to illustrate a talk about why we should, why the library community was, was ideally suited to be activists. And I came across a t-shirt that the community, someone in the community had created around the time uh, some provisions in the Patriot Act were being challenged. And the t-shirt simply read, libraries, the thin blue line between you and the FBI. <laughs> And, and I thought, yeah, okay, we're, 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 we're in the right space, we're the right people to be doing this, and, and we should be unafraid. Um, playing offense, playing defense, being proactive, tank, uh, 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 standing back. One other thing that Jim has taught me is that those are just stances, and that they both have merits, and you need to use them as stances, as strategies, sometimes simultaneously, and pick your spots for, for what works best in what situations. Um, we, we simply have to, the only thing we need to do is, is choose which strategy to deploy and stand up and do it. Very simple, terrifying responsibility, and exhilarating opportunity all wrapped up into one. Um, and that's what we've tried to do in, uh, the terms of, in terms of the, the, the policy arena, the policy area, uh, of opening up access to the results of research. If I've learned nothing else from Jim, it's before we look at taking action, we have to make sure that we do our homework. At, at a retirement for one of my colleagues, Jim said something that I'm, I'm sure you don't remember, um, but that has stayed with me uh, when my predecessor retired. Uh, Jim commented that one of the things he admired about Rick Johnson, uh, the founding executive director of, of Spark, was his work ethic, and he used the line, there's simply no substitute for doing the work. And I've taken that to heart over the last decade because we are most effective as a library community in influencing policy when we're considered expert and when our community's collective expertise is respected. Um, our, inf our influence can be leveraged exponentially uh, when we have that position of authority. And there's no faking expertise. Uh, there's no, no meaning in empty rhetoric. You have to do the legwork. We have to find the meaningful data to back up our positions. And because we're libraries, we always, always, always find the data, and we always, always, always source it properly. <laughs> and people respect that. Um, we do the research, and what's more, if the research doesn't exist, we find the credible experts and encourage them to do it. And then we thoughtfully consider the results. We get the facts, and we don't ignore the inconvenient ones when we shape our position. We do shape our position together, we make our plan. We get buy-in from the community, and then, and only then, do we take action to be proactive in this policy environment. As library professionals, we're individuals, as well as part of a larger community, um, and larger sets of communities on top of that. And our options for sort of seizing the reins and taking actions in the policy arena reflect those operating realities. We have lots of options for how we can choose to be proactive uh, in this environment. We can take individual action or collective action. And again, what we've learned is that both are appropriate, both need to happen. They can happen simultaneously or they can happen individually. As individuals, uh, if you do take that afternoon, uh, a slow afternoon and read Jim's CV, you'll see that this is something that he's lived as an individual as well as a library director, as well as as a member of library organizations, and as well as a leader in coalitions of groups that span a much larger reign than the library community itself. We can choose to take individual action by taking a seat on the study group or uh, round table or advisory council when, it, when it's offered to us and be prepared to contribute, be prepared with our homework to contribute effectively. We can take action by writing that letter, writing that op-ed, going to the meeting, presenting at the briefing, give the testimony at the hearing. We can take action collectively by using the strength of a community, the library community, speaking with one voice and standing together for one principle. We can also help define that principle. Uh, the principle that the public deserves access to the results of research that their public tax dollars fund simply did not exist before, led by Jim, the library community helped to articulate that principle and make it now part of not only the law of the US, but international laws that are being developed around the world. 
The principle of democratizing access to knowledge is one that we represent probably better than any and more knowledgeably than any community that's out there. Um, and standing together, uh, we, do, we, we represent that principle very effectively. One of the things that's very important is to find the places uh, proactively uh, where we can take action. When we started out, we were very tentative in terms of, of finding the right place and, and knocking on the right door. Uh, 10 years ago, one bill was a big deal. Um, and one bill is a big deal. It's still an enormous deal. Um, but what we found out as we've progressed is that the policy playing field in the research arena in particular is multidimensional and global. And we've had to find a way to play effectively on this three-dimensional chessboard uh, by working not only with uh, our institutional politics and policies, state policies and politics, national politi policies and politics, but also international policies and politics. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that come to fruition um, as a campaign, in a campaign that we're running right now, which is to educate every single possible potential presidential, 2016 U.S. presidential candidate on the is issues of uh, the importance of opening up access to research articles, data, and educational resources. And finally, something that Jim said uh, near the end of his talk is something that, um, interestingly, coincidentally, I also chose to, to emphasize at the end of my talk, which is, it, how to say this the right way. Um, we have a wonderful coalition and a wonderful community. It's so important for us to continue to think about the ways that we can effectively expand the communities that we work with. Um, Jim was right to point out that probably one of our, our biggest risks is to continue to identify and empower and effectively train uh, the advocates who are willing to play on this crazy multi-dimensional chessboard in this policy environment and to do it effectively, to really be equipped uh, to go ahead. It sounds great to, to say, be on that study committee, testify in front of Congress. It's terrifying to most people when they're actually called on to do it. We need to help empower a whole new set of people to be able to do this effectively. And the most, uh, to, to my mind, and, and one of the things that we're trying to work on now uh, in the library community and, and through our efforts at Spark in particular, is to reach out to our students, our early career researchers, and our young librarians, and give them the opportunity to get trained and get empowered to be that next effective set of voices in this arena. A program that we ran last year, I think, encapsulates the possibilities and the, the optimism that we should feel that people want to do this. We just need to give them the opportunities to train them up to do this. We ran a conference in Washington, DC, and invited uh, students, early career researchers, and young librarians to apply to come and spend four days in our nation's capital uh, to work with leaders in the, um, uh, the, the open community, open data, open education, open access, to learn about issues and to become trained uh, to speak up as advocates. Uh, they spent four days with leaders and their peers and had one full day of training uh, to take meetings with a professional. We turned them loose, with supervision of course, uh, on members of Congress, uh, federal agencies with their ambassadors and their, uh, their um, uh, uh, representatives, and also with the White House. Uh, the thing that I want to point out the most is that we're repeating this program again this year. We'd like to do it not just uh, once, uh, but we'd like to make this a regular thing because we were able to support 110 of the 2,000 students and early career researchers and librarians who applied to be part of this. The demand is there. There's reason for optimism. Uh, Jim is right to point out that this is an area of tremendous risk, but we see the need, see the hole, and we can collectively step up to the plate and fill it. Thank you. Um, before Jim Neal speaks, I would just like to deliver some words on behalf of Barbara Jones, uh, as I said, Director of the Office of Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association. She could not be here today, but she did wish to make an announcement, and this is like the first announcement of this, that Jim Neal had been awarded the Freedom to Read Foundation a Role Honor for 2015. So this is the, this is the statement. 
I am so sorry that I cannot be, be, be here to thank Jim Neal in person for all he has done for the American Library Association, Association, the Freedom to Read Foundation, and the International Federation of Library Associations. In particular, he has vigorously supported the core values of these organizations when others might have taken a more expedient route. Jim and I have worked together as far away as Japan for IFLA and for decades in ALA and Freedom to Read Foundation. He claims the record for the amount of funds he raised for academic libraries in particular for the Freedom to Read Foundation, and we are deeply grateful as we celebrate our 45th year. For this constant dedication to Freedom to Read, Jim has just been awarded the Freedom to Read Foundation Roll of Honor for 2015. Details are forthcoming, and he will accept the award in San Francisco ALA annual meeting in June. You raise a lot of money, they got to give you an award, I guess. <laughs> so let me just say one thing that I culled out from my earlier remarks. Community standards, family values, national security, political correctness, too often become excuses for censorship and rationales to violate our privacy. Progress in technology too often becomes an excuse to purge information block access, monitor behavior, and, lost, and advance one point of view. That is why I have made a, a, a career commitment uh, to being very much part of the freedom to read advocacy. Um, it's an illness. I'm serving my third term on the executive board of the American Library Association. But that gives me an opportunity to work with the Office of Intellectual Freedom. I'm in the middle of my fourth term on the board of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, so I've been on the educational side, OIF, and on the advocacy and legal side of this extraordinary set of issues. To me, there's nothing more important to our professional values than what we do through the, the work of OIF and the Freedom to Read Foundation. Let me read Barbara's statement. I'm so sorry I can't be with you today due to illness. Thanks to Jim for delivering my remarks. In my role on Committee A of the American Association of University Professors, and in my own career as an academic librarian for 35 years, I have seen the freedom to read in action and what happens when it is threatened. On Bascom Hill at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, there is a plaque from a tenure case in 1894, which was decided by the UW Board of Regents in favor of tenure. This is what it says. Whatever may be the limitations with travel inquiry elsewhere, we believe that the great state University of Wisconsin should ever encourage that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. I'm sending this to the governor of Wisconsin. <laughs> I, that was a parenthetical statement. <laughs> Academic libraries are where students, faculty, and staff in the community do that essential sifting and winnowing. The library has content, be it cuneiform tablets, medieval manuscripts, a Toni Morrison novel, digital journals, or 3D printing of a human heart someday soon. How do we put intellectual freedom in action so that faculty and students get the benefits of the treasure of information in all its diversity. This content must be made available with as few barriers as possible. One of the most insidious barriers is the software filter. Yes, some academic libraries do have filters. These prevent scholars, researchers, and students from sifting and winnowing among various websites and data. If some points of view are blocked from consideration, People may miss the information they need. It is crucial that students learn how to evaluate information sources, <coughs> and they can't if bad examples are filtered out. A frequently overlooked barrier is reader privacy. It was at Columbia University that one of Columbia's librarians, Paula Kaufman, recently retired library director from the University of Illinois at Brown and Champaign, stood up in the 1980s against the FBI's monitoring of international students. 
The FBI asked her to provide the names of foreign library student patrons or students with accents and to reveal what databases they searched. She refused. What she made this library, she, when she made this library awareness program public, it rocked the library community in LA to ALA to one of its proudest moments in fighting this invasion of the privacy of our students. At one university where I worked, faculty did not want books on creationism in the library, only titles on Darwin's evolutionary theory. How then do students know what Darwin's op opponents are talking about, even if it flies in the face of scientific method. Right up the street from here, the Jewish Theological Seminary holds copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is in some parts of the world considered as true, but in fact was published as a propaganda tool. JTS wants its students to understand what anti-Semitism in the early 20th century Russia looked like. Academic libraries are increasingly the home for civic engagement and activities supporting critical thinking. After the Sandy Hook massacre, Holy Cross's library held a community discussion about gun violence. Libraries are the perfect place for people to interact with information and with each other, and to have information at their fingerprints should they want to explore further. Students must be informed about intellectual freedom and privacy in order to, to exercise their right to read and to protest when it is taken away. When the Office for Intellectual Freedom sponsored two university student interns to help us bring banned book weeks to college campuses, they were shocked that censorship exists in the academy. And the students at Lane Tech College Prep High School learned the hard way. When the college, Chicago Public Schools attempted to remove the novel, the graphic novel, Persopolis, from the curriculum, the students staged a 700 sit down, 700 student sit down in the halls. They made the national use, and the, and the Chicago Public Schools eventually restored the book to the curriculum. Campuses must resist the temptation to buckle to donors and wealthy parents who are prospective donors. At one of my positions, I was asked not to purchase LGBT materials from a particular donor fund. This problem is increasing as donors fund campus buildings and programs with more strings attached, and administrators need more funds for campus survival. Finally, the latest threat to intellectual freedom is from trigger warnings. The AUP Committee on A and Academic Freedom recently released a statement about the labeling of course materials that may trigger PTSD or other responses from students. My favorite example is the Chinua Achebe book, Things Fall Apart recommended for a trigger warning at one campus because it might cause a violent response to those oppressed by colonialism. The AAU committee statement warns that libraries could, could be pressured to label books that might lead to trauma. It hasn't happened yet, to my knowledge, but it is possible. As librarians devoted to information literacy, to critical thinking, and to sifting and winnowing, how can we best uphold our core values? The Freedom to Read Foundation, the ACRL's Committee on Professional Values, the Office for Intellectual Freedom are well-established, professionally expert places to get started. People working in libraries must learn those core values, whether they are a library guard or whether they are the library director. At one of my jobs, the guards were pulling students away from computer terminals when they were viewing content that offended the guards. It only took one conversation with the guards to change that situation. Sadly, OIF's survey of LIS programs does not show a deep commitment to teaching core values, even if this commitment appears in our library school accreditation standards. I am constantly shocked by a Facebook conversation among new librarians and how much they were not taught in library school about what was labeled as porn. The Freedom to Read Foundation has established a graduate level credit bearing course at the University of Illinois and we provide scholarships and textbooks for students around the world. This, I think, this is a barber statement. Uh, I think there are, uh, there has been a historical tendency to look at issues of access 
to information, freedom to read issues as public library issues because of the notoriety of the attempts um, in schools and in public settings uh, to ban books. But I think there are many things going on in the academic environment which we need to be concerned about uh, and to make sure that our students and faculty are in no way uh, compromised in their ability to access and use the information that they need. There are enormous risks. So I encourage everyone in this room, if you are not a member of the Freedom to Read Foundation, it is only $35 per year, and I'll get you signed up if you want. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience. I would perhaps like to begin with a question to Heather. Um, if you can perhaps address what concerns Spark may have with the 2016 election coming up and how that may affect the op open access, specifically the 2013 memorandum? So this, is this on? So the specific concern, I don't even know if they're on. Okay, specific concern that we have is that the memorandum is just that, a memorandum that doesn't actually uh, carry the, the, the weight of law. Uh, and a new administration can overturn it with basically the stroke of a pen. So. The election uh, is important to us to, to make sure we have an administration that comes in that holds the value uh, of open access um, and reusability of research, uh, it, it, assuming that Congress doesn't codify it into to permanent law. Okay. Um, Craig, I was also wondering, you got me at expand access. Uh, certainly that's something that we all promote, but then you talked about not getting sued. Um, and most libraries are not like fortunate enough to have someone like you on board. If they have legal counsel, it's usually the same person who does real estate and HR. Um, and the advice that librarians usually get is don't do. Um, so how do you balance that chilling effect with what our mission is within institutions where digitization is happening? So I'll give our general counsel's credit uh, uh, and not just say they're always saying no. Uh, it took us four years, but we got there. We, we had long conversations with our general counsel about our mission and how saying no every time impacts our ability to do our work. Um, those best practices statements that you saw were a helpful way to start those conversations. We were able to say this is what the community of practice believes is a fair use. This is what we think is going to be within the bounds of fair use. And it's time to get on board. And it was also helpful to have senior management who were very invested in that to say, you know, we're willing to take that risk on. We understand the legal risk, but we're willing to take it on. Are there questions from the audience? OK, I guess everybody needs their coffee by now. <laughs> um, so thank you for your participation.